Right guys, Jack here at JBF Music and Guitar Lessons. This time I'm armed with my acoustic guitar for a breakdown, a bit of analysis of Bandmate's new song, Memorable. This will be an analysis video, there'll be lots of pausing, lots of talking about things. If you just want my first time listening to it, I'll link to it with the eye up there. Before we crack into it, a huge shout out and a massive thank you to the ever awesome Rabbi Rabs, Matt Hartsman, Glenn Kelly, Stephen Williams and Rebecca Hay for their continued support on Patreon. Thanks so much guys. If you have the means and inclination to hit up the channel or you have something that you really think I should check out, make sure to hit up patreon.com forward slash JBF Music. It lets me keep doing these and any type of support is appreciated. If you don't fancy doing that, a like and a comment just helps a huge, huge load with the algorithm as well. So there's one thing in particular that really stuck out to me is they did almost like a kind of false crescendo where they make it loud just for the start of the chorus and then the volume kind of drips down. It's an incredibly powerful thing to do, particularly when you've got like a ballad where the whole idea is the song is slowly uh, like building up throughout it. So if you think about the song, like a crescendo is just the, the fancy way of things getting louder, that's a musical term for it. And the line is quite intuitive, it's like a triangle. So the, the end where they're close together is the quietest bit, and when the two lines are like this is when it's loudest. So they're not filled in here, it's just like two lines. This is the loudest bit, this is the quietest bit. And if you think about the general contour of a ballad, overall it'll get louder, but there'll still be kind of dips within it. So it's almost like these little uh, meta <laughs> crescendos within the larger crescendo. Oh, we're off to we're off to a terrible start here, aren't we? I apologise. <laughs> right, let's start at the start. Pause things. Go through it. There was something I was talking about at the start. Yes. Yeah, so here, this um, it looks like it's probably a drone shot. The reason I bring this up is there is a guy I was playing in a band with briefly. He did a cover for uh, the drummer when he couldn't make the gigs. And I think we played in the continent with him a bit as well. We played in Germany with him. But uh, he was mates with Ed, the drummer from The Darkness, um, and played in Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols band as well. But he was saying they were doing a video shoot and he was impressed at like how they managed to get these great kind of swooping cinematic shots by just using these drones. And this would be about kind of five, maybe seven years ago from, from like, probably longer than that actually. Oh, let's say seven years ago, um, because the drones make it much more affordable. Uh, in the past, you need to have like a, a huge kind of crane to do these big swooping shots, which like if you're on a kind of smallish budget, it's just not feasible, particularly like getting the kind of planning permission to set this up and, and uh, do everything, let alone transport it there and actually kind of hire it. So it's really cool that as um, you know, technology kind of gets more affordable, you can get a much more polished looking video on a much smaller budget. Now they might have still set up a crane here but it would make more sense economically to just have a, have a drone with a camera on it. But yeah that's what I was mumbling about in the, in the reaction. I'll pop the lyrics back on here as well. So here it's just really simple, just got the Guitars on each side, left and right, and the vocals. Uh, the vocals are very, very breathy. Almost kind of whispered. It sounds like they're being harmonised or doubled. Yeah. There's a little harmony underneath. It's very quiet in the mix. At least I think it's there. My brain's inventing it if it's not. So it's. Rather than being a harmony above the vocal, it's kind of below it in terms of pitch and also in terms of volume. It's just... That bit was really cool. There was proper whispering there. So they would have got up really close to the microphone. And then you can get um, a whisper kind of loud enough. Get quite a kind of intimate sound. The thing you need to watch with that is you get a thing called sibilance. So if this exaggerate my S is there to try and make it happen, it's any sort of cis sound, you sometimes get this spiking sound and there's a thing called a de -esser, which it takes out, it's a brilliant name, it takes out the S's. Um, so I, I tend to put those on my videos so it's not um, horrible to listen to. But if you check this out in the whispered bit, it is a bit more tss, the sibilance. Where was it? So even that kind of ch that kind of chiss sound is going to kind of affect the sibilance a little bit as well. It sounds like it's been recorded with uh, microphones fairly close to the guitars uh, the acoustics because if you listen here, there's a fret noise. 
which is the sign of like um, just a microphone quite close to the guitar, quite a probably sensitive microphone, and it's going to pick up all these little movements as well. Cool, so there's a kind of palm meetings, so they're kind of particularly on the left here to keep kind of a rhythm and keep it a bit percussive. The right guitar is opened up and doing a bit more picking. In fact, I'm telling you a lie, there's a double tracked unmuted guitar here. Double tracked just means you're playing the same thing again, it sounds bigger. Over the top of that, there's a picked part. And then there's this really nice kind of jazzy descent. Yeah, well, that was really nice. I think there's a tiny bit of chorus on the guitar as well there. Yeah, it kind of melts on that last chord. Ding. Ding. Yeah, ding. A G minor. Cool. What well, sounds to me is like it's uh, an E minor. I can't totally tell how they're playing it, I take a guess that they're going 7 on the A string, 5 on the D, 4 on the G, and then the open B string as well, which is just doubling up that 4th fret on the G. could even strum the full thing. That E's definitely not in there at the top. Just a nice kind of mellow minor chord. And then we can hear the little whispers coming in again, I didn't clock that the first time. Um, almost taking a breath before the chorus. Here it is. And what they've done with the, I didn't point this out before, with the whispers, you've got the main vocal down the middle, and the whispers would be panned to the left and the right, so if you had the headphones in, it'd probably sound like someone's just kind of come up to your, your ear. If you listen to older Bowie, I think he might have done it on... Ziggy Stardust. Don't quote me on that, but there's songs where Barry used to double track rather than have one vocal in the middle. He's notoriously very good at double track and he'd get the vocals really tight. But if you listen to Bowie in the headphones, you quite often got uh, Bowie on your left and Bowie on your right rather than a Bowie down the middle. Whereas kind of the standard way to do things now is to have the vocal down the middle and the, the backing at the sides. They used to do interesting things. I think there's even some David Bowie songs where the drums are just panned over to like the left or to the right, which is really, it's a really interesting thing to do because now the drums are kind of in the middle as well, like your kick drums in the middle, your snares, and then the kind of cymbals are at the side to add a bit of width. Yeah, and this is a thing I thought was very clever. This first hit of the chorus, right? Little whispers. Also, the guitar is dropped out there to give another boost here. Um, it's really loud, right? And then a dip. So you don't need to keep it as loud as that. There's been that initial hit. We know it's a sex and change. We know it's bigger. And it almost kind of tricks your brain into thinking the full sound is louder. It, it doesn't need to be. And then that really helps this kind of ballad thing where we're trying to, you know, build up our, our meta crescendo. It is still louder, but it's not gone up to it's not gone up to eleven. I think that's a same as the kind of interlude chord progression we had at the end there. Could be mistaken. Right, just before the, the chorus. It sounds like they might have a capo on here. The guitar is a very shimmery, very shiny a capo basically. It just moves the knot artificially. So pop that on your guitar and now my fifth fret has become the nut so what it means is see I was more comfortable singing in this register I could play my same open chords I don't have to learn new shapes and I've been playing weird well, I suppose it's just a C and an F so it was in a weird key I needed to play a let's say a nasty chord like a, 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 a B flat which guitarists don't really like um, I can do that That's, B flat done. I don't have to do some sort of uh, big bar chord. It's side, they might not be using a capo here, but it sounds like they are because there's this kind of shimmer to the sound. If I go further up and just play some chords, you'll probably get an idea of what I'm meaning. It's almost a bit more like a banjo or something or a, a ukulele.
because what I've done essentially is you're shortening the scale length of the instrument and when you're doing that you're making it higher in pitch and sort of brighter as well so it sounds like they've done that to me but I could be wrong might be a 12 string in the mix here as well well there's an interesting little fill there or was it oh there's some really cool stuff going on there's um it's all these little blink and you miss it there's a little swell of feedback here just just as the chorus ends and then so maybe just um might just be playing a little fill on the the room of the snare or even i have known drummers that do little fills on the um the, like the cymbal stand because you get this kind of tick -tick sound if you're a drummer and you know better than me which you probably do let me know what's happened there i think that's reversed i think they've done that in the studio if they played a chord probably an e minor or an e7 e5 even Played that, they've taken the clip and then reversed it, so hopefully a bit of jiggery pokery future Jack will do that for you just now. I might even be able to reverse the whole clip. Uh, so the reason it sounds I think it's reversed is because it starts out well, when we play things forward as like the initial hit and then it gets quieter. When it's reversed, it kind of has the quietness and then ends on the loud sound. There's ways to achieve it. Like you could um, do a volume swell or something like that. I can link to more information on those with the eye up there. Or use a volume pedal. It's like using a swell, but you can control the volume with your foot. And what's quite cool here is where the drums have come in, they're still not crowding up the mix too much. They're very prominent, but you can still hear everything else and the bass is coming in dun, dun, dun. I would as a slight slight criticism here I think with the bass I would maybe have taken some of the treble off a wee bit of the spank out um, for the verses um, maybe just playing closer to the neck because uh, it's a wee bit a wee bit spanky for the song but I suppose that must be what they're going for to give it still a bit of a bit more kind of attack a bit more bite to it Oh, interesting. What I was going to say there is I'd maybe use my fingers <laughs> for this part and then the pick for the chorus, but it looks like she might actually be using her, her fingers for this. Unless she's doing the Getty Lee. Um, you don't know what the Getty Lee trick is, the uh, guy from Rush. Um, if you watch him play, it looks really weird. It's like he's kind of like just, you know, trying to scratch at his base. It's because he grows his fingernail long enough that he kind of uses that almost like a plectrum. So if you ever wondered how Getty Lee gets that kind of like sharp spanky tone but looks like he's doing finger style it's because he's um using his fingernail i think anyway i could be completely misremembering mis that so she might have long enough fingernails that they're kind of hitting against the string um i think steve harris does that as well when he does his gallop the uh what would it be like dun, 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 dun. i can't do it on a guitar so there's something yeah so you'd go like through the string then back down this one can't get any speed on the guitar. Okay, I can do it a bit there. And so you get more of a attack when the nail goes through, as opposed to the pad of the fingers. So she, it might be it might be something like that as well. Although it looks like she's just going fingers. The nail might be long enough, as I say. And there, um, you see Konami's playing with her fingers, and there is a very different sound if you play with a pick on guitar compared to fingers. Or it is to me anyway, it's much mellower. Like, say if I pick the notes with the pick, I use my fingers. Apart from the fingers being quieter, the tombra, even if I dig in more. isn't quite as sharp and defined. It's got a much more mellow kind of sound to it. Uh, all these kind of small tweaks that you'll kind of work on in the, the studio to get the, the timbre right for the vibe. And this is a cool little bass line here, isn't it? We're going. Do, do, do. 
Yeah, it's really nice. A uh, little bit of octave work in the bass. And that little... That just reminded me of... Under the Bridge. I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna check that out. I think that's a major 7th though. Okay, okay, so I don't think it's a, an E minor, which I, I might have said that in this video, or the reaction. So this is interesting, it reminded me of um, Under the Bridge, and I went and had a quick listen to that and checked the tab, and it's this lovely little chord that kind of happens as a break, um, halfway through the verse and I think just before the chorus, you just hear this thing ringing out. And that's, that's a major 7, that's a sound that I know, so I wanted to check it against this song. Obviously it's in a, a, a different chord, we're playing a C major 7 here. I'll play it. Here we are. Right, that sounds right to me. So, the reason why I thought, well, I'll play what I thought it was. Right, this is what I think it actually is now. So, very little difference between them. Right? The, the reason for this is, is if this is boring music theory, then, then go past it. An E minor is an E, a G, and a B. When we play those notes together at the same time, we call that E minor. C major 7 is a C, an E, a G, and a B. So you might be noticing, oh hang on, is that not just the same as an E minor? Pretty much, but there's a C in it. Yeah, you're right. This is how music works, all the notes are stacked in what we call thirds in, in, in Western music anyway. So you could, if you really wanted to, call it a, an E minor slash C, because that means there's a, a C in the root whenever there's a slash. That means like this is, usually you use it for an inverted chord, so it would be a note that's already in the chord. You get it in piano as well, so you might have something like um, uh, a, a G slash A, so we might have like a... So you might get kind of movement. A G slash F sharp. G slash E. F sharp. E. So it's not part of the chord, but you quite often use it for to create a bit of movement. So hopefully I've explained that well enough that a C major 7 M has an E minor hiding in it. I, the reason this works is because the seventh chord has four notes in it, whereas a standard triad just has three. So just to condense that down, because I think I rambled a little bit, tie that up a nice little bow and then we can push off to the side. A C major, for reference, would be a C, an E, and a G. So just three notes if you're playing the triad. If we extend it, we add in an extra note, the B, so it becomes a C major 7. It's a major sound happy and this is a major 7th, hence C major 7. And you'll notice there that E minor triad hiding, hiding in amongst the C major 7. This is when I'll listen back to it the next time when I'm editing and I'll realise it's not a major 7 card at all, it's something different and I've just rambled on uselessly <laughs> for like 10 minutes or something. But I think uh, just now present me thinks that's what it is. Cool, that was a really nice break. Uh, the bass and the kick drum, dum dum, and then a little doo doo. I think. That dum dum. C. Gotta double check that riff. So I think it's something like Yeah, so open E Third fret on the B Then open G And then I've just slide from the third fret to the fifth on the E So, so it sounds like there might be a double stop in there No, I don't think so Just one more time. Here we are. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. And then there's the chorus again. 
and louder than the last chorus, I feel anyway. Um, the guitar strumming a bit more, the bass really filling out the sound. When I was talking about the drums uh, before, I think I'd mentioned something like um, hot rods or brushes. This might be in the react rather than this video. Um, what hot rods are is essentially like a set of on like a big thick drumstick. It's like almost like small chopsticks uh, bundled together, like sort of kindling. Uh, and because there's like space in between these sticks, when you hit the drum, it's not as loud. It's a kind of softer sound. So if you have to play a, a gig at a quieter volume, they're worth using because you don't have to like play really softly, you can still hit, hit the drums and it won't ever be quite as loud. Brushes are kind of what they sound like, it's like almost like a little brush, you know, the kind of, almost looks like a little egg whister or a pastry brush, you quite often see the jazz guys do them uh, on their on their ride cymbal. It was, uh, I took a flashback from a Stuart Lee bit that he goes on about the rap singers and you see them in the, <laughs> in the supermarket. Oh. <laughs> Oh, gather myself together. Just be thankful I didn't, <laughs> didn't keep going on about. <laughs> you see the the jazz, the, the jazz players with their little brushes. Uh, if if you know Stuart Lee, then you, you'll know what I'm going on about here. The best thing I saw was someone had um, edited together. Oh, this is a complete tangent here. As Stuart Lee a uh, bit, and one one of his things is he keeps repeating things. And it's in the same way as Harry Hill did it, where like eventually it becomes funny again. It like stops being funny for quite a while and becomes a slog. And then eventually it becomes funny again, and they might get called back at the end of the set. And someone had edited this video um, of like a small, maybe 20 second clip of him going round and doing something, but they've edited it so perfectly that it was just like on a loop. And it took me minutes, like literally watching it loads of times round before I realised that they'd looped it. I thought it was just Stuart Lee doing his thing. It's a monotonous kind of grinding <laughs> repetition. <laughs> uh, I, if, if I find that video, I'll link to it because it, it was uh, a comedy genius as far as I'm concerned. The idea I get from Ban Me to Stuart Lee. Oh, <laughs> it's not a bad thing, is it? Just a nice jing, 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 jing rhythm. Something I will mention here is when they recorded these, I think they were using quite thin plectrums. So. The thicker the plectrum, the harsher it is against the string. So if I play it on this, it's more noticeable on um, acoustics. So say if they are kind of an E minor, you can probably hear this raking across the strings. It's almost like the kind of Pac-Man noise or something. So you can hear a little scratchy chick chick ch If I use a slightly kind of thinner pick, you can still hear this. If I use this really thin pick, very bendy, it'll kind of bend across the strings. So you get this more kind of bright spangly and you can strum and you don't get the same kind of clunky sound that you would for thicker picks. So for reference I'll do it one more time, here's the thickest pick, you can hear the middle pick, this is the type of one I tend to use as a happy medium, you can still hear quite a bit of the string attack and the thinnest one which is kind of what you want to record with really. You get this really nice soft sound, so you're getting more of the guitar and less of the pick attack. You can also just use your fingers and a bit of your nail if you're not comfortable using a thin plectrum. It's a nice uh, picking going on as well here. It's an interesting enough chord progression to not be, because sometimes with a ballad, you strip things down too much and it's, it becomes a bit kind of. I'm going to say Ed Sheeran in there, it's a bit of a nasty thing to say. A bit too, uh, I don't know, basic or a bit kind of too standard. There's an interesting double on the word dream there. Catch it. That, so that's a great example when I was talking in the intro about there being a harmonised vocal underneath the main vocal. When you listen to dream there, so she'll be on an A. The, Harmony might be might be a C. So it might actually just be doubled an octave below. My ears aren't picking up on it. It might just be the same note sung an octave lower, so one, two, three. Dream. And again it's just like a meticulous uh, attention to detail. It's just tiny, tiny, tiny little things they keep putting in. And even there, a little breath in. Kind of 
there's like a double uh, breath in that you could have edited out if you wanted to in the, in the digital audio workstation. You can cut and move it along. It's very straightforward to do. Um, so I think that's probably been left in intentionally because it's a bit like, you know, when you have that whispering thing, you get this like close kind of quiet sound. There's some harmonics there as well. Yes, okay. So we've got harmonics on the fifth fret on the D, G and B. And the last one's warbling a little bit. Yeah. So there could just be a chorus effect on there to make it kind of wobble a bit. If you listen to the last one in particular, the dun dun dun, third one. Really nice stop as well. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Can I kind of hear it oscillating? You could do it on electric guitar and use your whammy bar. It might, might be done like that. Be interesting to see how they do this one uh, live because. Here they've got one electric and one acoustic, and you get a thing uh, called uh, piezo pickups. So this this is actually how this electric, this is an acoustic electric, you can plug it in there, um, and underneath, uh, hidden underneath this bridge here, the kind of white thing there, right, are these little piezo pickups. So when I plug this in, it's not getting... Uh, kind of sound of the microphone, it's getting the sound of these pickups, which isn't my favourite sound, it's a wee bit uh, kind of... So a, a certain attack to piezos I don't particularly like, but it's much more convenient than having to mic things up or put a pickup in here and try to mute it out so it doesn't feed back. The reason I bring that up is you can get electric guitars with a piezo sitting in the bridge, so you can just flick a wee switch and you get a really kind of authentic acoustic sound. So it'd be interesting to know if she's got a guitar set up like that, um, or if it's just electric or they do the thing where there's a, an acoustic on a stand at this stage and go up and play that like um, Iron Maiden used to do in Wasting Love when they did that live. So I've managed to get Iron Maiden and Stuart Lee into a band-made ballad. Quite pleased with myself. <laughs> Cool, and um, here there's a big fill to bring it in. There you can hear there's a lot of tom work. Uh, the toms work quite well because Fills out the sound, but it's not as kind of as like a cymbal or as, as a snare. It's still somewhat soft, which is interesting because you can make them sound kind of evil and tribal, like in um, Enter Sandman or something like that. You know, but here, they're kind of adding more momentum to it without um, making it too splashy and crashy because you still kind of want to go somewhere. Just a very strange little solo here, very unique lines. There's an overdub going on here as well. So, there's a other guitar, so you've got like at least three guitars here. Be interesting if that's a dual solo live actually, but then she'd need to be on the electric as well. Very strange uh, little uh, lines, very short and kind of snappy, it's not what I would have expected. I yeah, I really like those clicks. Uh, so if what I think they've done is double tracked or probably multi tracked the clicks, so instead of just having one click, everyone comes in and you click several times and you get people different distances from the microphone, so the further away you go, the more kind of relaxed the click is. If it's here, this will probably make my mic peak. It'll probably sound quite different to this one. Not just in terms of loudness, but in terms of timbre. This is softer when it's further away. It's the same thing with the plectrum, the softer plectrum, compared to the thicker one where it had that kind of clunkier sound. So I suspect that's what they've done. They've probably taken some of the high end off the clicks and probably put a bit of um, reverb on as well, to so they're not quite as percussive because it's quite can be a quite uh, that's a click, isn't it? It's that sort of sound. It could be a bit grating. Yeah, they've mixed really nicely, and you can hear a slight, maybe a delay, a delay or reverb on them. And it's, it's really good, because it's uh, without them, it's like a little bit of r the rhythm missing. And it's this idea, like I say, of continually adding, so even when you've dipped down and you've gone to the vocals and the guitar, we've still got this percussive element. 
And then it's more effective when you have the kind of big fill coming in. And I think this chorus is louder again than the last one, so it, it, in my head anyway, each chorus has gotten slightly louder as well. Well, that's a thing that's worthwhile pointing out. Um, so here on the stage, right, blinking you'll miss it, right, um, I'm going to try and gonna take a punt of where it's going to be there. Uh, on the mic stand, I've probably missed it entirely. You can see that the, it's a kind of weird foam thing and lots of plectrums in it. It's just from a practical point of view, it's good to have stuff like that. If you drop your pick, you can just go to your mic stand and get a new one. It also looks like a very sturdy guitar strap that gives someone there. Uh, that's when you're playing for quite a while, you want something that's like better than just a little bit of material. I've started getting quite thick ones with padding on them because um, I keep getting a hard knot under my left shoulder. I'm trying to get rid of with a cork massage ball. I've made progress, guys. I've made some progress. <laughs> What's cool as well is that the video itself has kind of uh, changed too. So instead of it being that kind of uh, drone shot, just Miku walking in the kind of, I don't know, kind of wildernessy, almost kind of rocky desert thing, uh, it's got them on the stage, which works really nicely with the more instruments coming in and then playing as a band in the chorus and at the end of the song. I still interjecting, I suppose, with the cinematic shots because that's your, you know, the narrative they've been telling this little story. So there is a D chord. There's that. Yeah. So it's the real in standard tuning. That's what I was trying to get out there. And you can hear that um, backing vocal underneath the main vocal, in terms of pitch and volume. Ah, I was wondering, right, so the very last line I thought was particularly effective, and I think that's why, because the band drops out, you've got the harmonised vocal and the vocal by itself. So that dream still, and it's quite a lot of vibrato on the harmony. And quite, again, quite a breathy uh, one to finish it off. And it reminded me of the um, final line in Daydreaming, because I think it did a similar thing. And it was almost like she just kind of woken up or something. Lovely way to end it out. Yeah, cool. Anyway. Yeah, like I say, not a huge ballad fan, but still plenty, plenty interesting and cool things going on there. Loads of stuff I wouldn't have thought about as well, like the kind of whispering, and not even like um, the main vocal, just in the backing. Just really little guitar fills here and there, the clicks. Stuff that, um, this is when the benefits of being a, in a band, a collaborative thing, or with a good producer can, can really help, because those are things I'd never think of. And now I can put them in my little bag of tricks, but it's like, um, you know, if, if you just got you and your run ideas, you kind of hear the more people you have, a kind of Venn diagram of sorts, I suppose, the more more ideas you're going to be able to, to, to pull on. As subtle as they are, well, there might be things you don't immediately notice. Um, it's just all the, wee, all the wee details add up, all the little kind of bits of finesse to create this nice packaged song. Something you'd like me to check out, make sure to help Patreon, check out these videos. If you don't want to do either of those, a like and a comment goes a really long way. Hit subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. Cheers, guys. I hope you're all having a great one.